Good afternoon, good evening, good morning viewers, wherever you are located. Thank you for joining us today as we discuss a very important and relevant topic on vaccine development, availability and safety. We have a great panel. Kindly engage with them as much as you can uh, to get your questions answered. Before we proceed, we would like you to know that this webinar will be recorded and can be accessed on our YouTube page, as well as on our website under videos in the coming week. Some features have been disabled, this being audio and video sharing, as well as screen share. You're welcome to submit your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. The moderator will direct your questions to the panel towards the end of the session. So kindly remember to use the Q&A session and not the chat section. For more engaging programs, please subscribe to our mailing list by visiting our contact us page uh, on our website, globalcenters.columbia.edu forward slash Nairobi. Our moderator today is Dr. Daniel Ochiel. Dr. Ochiel is the Director of Laboratory Programs for Africa at IAVI, Nairobi, Kenya. He is an internationally trained scientist with an extensive experience in the fields of biomedical research. He currently serves in several senior leadership positions within IAVI to guide the strategy and implementation of research and training programs globally. Dr. Ochiel previously worked for the Columbia Global Centers Nairobi as uh, the program manager for Africa Nutritional Sciences Research Consortium, a multi-institutional collaborative postgraduate training program in East Africa funded by AFDB. He completed his postdoctoral fellowship at the Harvard T.H. Shan School of Public Health. He holds a PhD from Dartmouth College, a Master of Science from the University of Pittsburgh Graduate School of Public Health and Master of Science and Bachelor of Veterinary Medical Degrees from the University of Nairobi. I would now like to hand over to Dr. Ochiel take the program from here, Dr. Ochiel. Uh, thank you very much, Pauline, uh, really for that great introduction. Um, I would like to take this opportunity, first of all, to thank uh, the Global Center, Columbia Global Centers here in Nairobi, under the leadership of Dr. Murugi for uh, convening this webinar. Uh, as we've highlighted, we have a really, really good panel of distinguished presenters who not only bring um, uh, kind of their experience uh, in this field, but they also bring a lot of expertise, which will be very, very important as we uh, discuss the topic today. <clears throat> um, I think without really going to uh, further uh, details around uh, introductions, I would just like to remind ourselves that we are at a very, very critical stage in terms of uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, the numbers are still going up. Um, we have over 71 million uh, confirmed cases uh, globally uh, and well over 1.6 uh, million uh, deaths um, as, as a result of COVID. But at the same time, we have kind of an, in, an interesting um, uh, development because there are vaccines that have, have really come through. Uh, some of them already are being um, uh, uh, you know, in, in, uh, rolled out in programs. And so where we are now is we are with a pandemic. Uh, there are some interventions that are really working and the vaccines is really now coming into the stage uh, for, for implementation. So the discussion today is going to be really, really important. First of all, to set the stage in terms of what vaccines are out there, which, which vaccines are coming through. And then secondly, really to uh, begin to think of where, what is the context of, of these uh, vaccines? Where are we going to uh, uh, roll them out? In what geographical settings? What are some of the challenges that will come through? And how do we position ourselves so that these um, vaccination immunization programs are successful? 
And then I think that the other bit which we're going to discuss today, we're going to hear from our panel, is then discussing the issue of vaccine hesitancy and nationalism, which is really, really important in terms of uh, uptake of vaccines. So as I said, we have really a strong panel, um, which is going to guide us through this discussion. And I'm going to take the opportunity to just quickly um, introduce the panel in the order of which they're going to uh, give their presentations. So I'm going to start with Dr. Lawrence Stanbury, who is an expert in vaccine development and the editor of the textbook of vaccines for biodefense and emerging and elected diseases. Uh, Dr. Stanbury is a professor of pediatrics, is associate dean for the international programs and co-director of the program in vaccine education at the Bel Vagelos uh, College of Physicians and Surgeons at the Columbia University. So he's going to give our first presentation, um, uh, setting up uh, uh, the stage for the updates on vaccines. And then the second presenter um, is going to be uh, Professor Oman Zala, uh, who is a virologist and immunologist. He's a professor in the Department of Medical and Microbiology at the University of Nairobi, and actually served as the director of the Kenya AIDS Vaccine Initiative Institute of Clinical Research, CARBI, ICR, in Nairobi. He's a, he has a, a PhD in virology and immunology from the University of Manitoba uh, in Canada and a postdoctoral fellowship at the Mo Molecular Immunology Institute of, uh, at uh, Oxford University uh, in UK. He has served in very, very many roles, you know, being um, involved in direct uh, technical expertise and providing leadership in vaccinology, emerging infectious diseases, and has trained a number of, of uh, um, uh, researchers and scientists in HIV and other infectious diseases. Uh, then we're going to have also hear from uh, Dr. Philip Larusso, who is a, ped a pediatric infectious disease specialist and a special lecturer in the Department of Pediatrics at Columbia University in New York. <laughs> Uh, he has over four decades of experience in clinical epidemiology uh, infection, of infectious diseases research, not only in local settings, but globally. And he has been the principal investigator of the US uh, CDC Clinical Immunization Safety Assessment Center at Columbia University since 2001. So his presentation about um, vaccine safety is gonna be really, really uh, aligned with some of the um, expertise and experience that he has had so far. And then the last presenter is going to be Dr. Yanis ben -Mo, who is the executive director of the Center for Sustainable Development, a leading center of research around sustainable development goals, which is also based at Columbia University. Uh, Dr. Mo has over 15 years of experience, uh, research experience in infectious diseases. He is mainly focused on tuberculosis, HIV, and also Ebola and has really many projects uh, you know, running uh, globally, uh, conducting research and also exploring new diagnostic tests for TB, HIV, uh, and Ebola. Uh, Dr. Uh, ben Amor has a PhD in molecular biology. He has published widely in the areas of tubercul tuberculosis and uh, diagnosis, uh, global health, and infectious diseases uh, prevention. So as you can see, we have a very, very strong panel, uh, which is going to take us through these um, very interesting discussions. Uh, as Pauline highlighted earlier, so we'll encourage all of us to uh, share your questions on the, the chat box, and then I will direct your questions uh, to the right panel, uh, the panelists. So again, uh, without uh, further delay, uh, I would like to now give this chance uh, to Dr. Lawrence Tunbury to give our first presentation. Please take it away. Thank you, Dr. Ochala. Um, and uh, thank you, Dr. Marugi, for the invitation to participate today. Um, if Pauline could bring up the first slide, please. Thank you. So my responsibility this morning is to walk you through some of the vaccines that are in very advanced development now that will be available very shortly. Some are already available in select countries and we'll talk about their characteristics. Um, next slide, please. Uh, just by way of conflict of interest, the only conflict that's probably relevant is that I am a member of the Pfizer COVID uh, vaccine data monitoring committee and have been for a number of months now. Next slide, please. 
Um, what we're going to do today is to focus on the results of, the, to the extent we know them, <clears throat> of the ongoing phase three clinical trials. For those of you not familiar with uh, vaccine development pathways, uh, what we do in vaccines is once they've gone through animal testing, they move into humans in a phase one, phase two, phase three sequence. Phase one and two focus principally on immunogenicity and safety in very small numbers of individuals. And once there's a good indication that the vaccine is both able to produce an immune response and appears to be safe in a very small number of people, we move into much larger studies in the range of uh, 30 to 40,000 participants. Um, and so what we're going to look at is we look at a number of the vaccines that are in phase three development. We're going to look at the type of vaccine, what are the storage conditions, because that makes a great deal of difference <clears throat> depending on the infrastructure available for distribution of vaccines. We'll look at the dosing regimen, what we know about how immunogenic they are, what we know about efficacy. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the safety of each one, although you'll hear much more about safety from Dr. LaRussa cost, which is going to be very important, uh, and national approvals, which of these vaccines are already being approved for use in selected countries. Next slide, please. Um, I wanted to mention to you that currently there are 59 different vaccines being tested in humans, and 16 have now reached the phase three stage of testing. I think I should point out to you how absolutely remarkable that is. It typically takes in the range of 10 years uh, to develop a vaccine. And these vaccines are being developed at an absolutely record uh, pace. Um, when one considers that the first case of COVID-19 in Wuhan was in mid-November uh, of 2019, by mid-November 2020, uh, we already knew that we had one vaccine that had indication of being safe and effective. Next slide, please. Uh, the first one to mention, and these are not in any particular sequence, um, is the uh, Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. It was developed jointly by companies in the United States and Germany. It uses an RNA uh, platform expressing a spike protein. mRNA is, the uh, use of an mRNA platform is brand new. It's never been used for vaccine development. Uh, there are two vaccines in very advanced development using this type of a platform. There's a lot of advantages and we'll be hearing more about these in the future as new pandemic uh, pathogens arise because there's a lot of flexibility around using this type of a platform to be able to produce vaccines. The disadvantage of the Pfizer vaccine is it requires ultra cold storage. This is at minus 70 degrees Celsius, um, a temperature that uh, you won't find freezers like this outside most laboratories. So it, represents a challenge uh, for its distribution and storage. It uh, requires two doses uh, given intramuscularly of 21 days apart. Um, one hopes for a vaccine that requires only a single dose. So uh, two doses represents a bit of a challenge in terms of getting people back uh, for their second dose. We do know that it, it induces very robust antibody and cellular responses. And it also does that in not only in the young, but also in people over 65 years of age. It has a remarkable efficacy of 55, uh, 95%. Uh, we simply don't see that level of efficacy in most respiratory vaccines. Um, so this was unbelievably exciting to see this level of protection. And if we have time, maybe in the discussion, we can talk about the importance of efficacy, not only in protecting the person getting the vaccine, but in terms of being able to reach uh, the levels of herd immunity in a community that are really critical for control of a pandemic. The only safety concern that's been seen so far with regard to the Pfizer vaccine were two individuals who received the vaccine in the United Kingdom who developed an anaphylactoid reaction. Both of these individuals had a history of anaphylactic reactions and actually carried an EpiPen with them in the event of an allergic reaction that was life-threatening. So there'll be some warning about using this vaccine in individuals with that kind of a history. At this point, this cost, cost of this vaccine is going to be very high. In the United States, it's estimated to be in the range of about $50 a dose. But at this point, we do know that there are emergency use approvals 
for the, this vaccine in both the United Kingdom and the United States. And in both countries, uh, healthcare workers, uh, elderly and the people who care for elderly are uh, receiving the vaccine even, even as we speak. Uh, next slide, please. Another vaccine that's uh, where we have a good deal of data on um, is the Sinopharm uh, inactivated whole virus vaccine. This was the, the Sinopharm has a number of different vaccines. Uh, and this is the one that was developed by the uh, Beijing Biological Institute. This is one where one takes and grows up a very large amount of the virus and then chemically inactivates it and adds an adjuvant to it, alum, which is found in most of the common vaccines that are used uh, globally. It requires standard refrigeration, which is a real advantage. Again, a two dose regimen, 21 days apart is um, going to be how it's going to be used. We know from data published in the Lancet that it does induce neutralizing antibody and that is thought to be uh, the most important driver of protection. Although T cell uh, responses undoubtedly are important, uh, but we'll be looking later to find out what are the correlates of protection. But at this point, we know it's very immunogenic. Uh, it looks like it has an 81% efficacy uh, based on data coming out of the United Arab Emirates. Um, China, to their credit, has had such success in controlling the pandemic that the trials have needed to be done in places where there, are uh, where there are still a lot of COVID cases. And United Arab Emirates is one of those. There's no specific information on its effectiveness in the elderly. The reports coming out of the UAE indicated that over 125 nationalities were involved in the vaccine trial, and uh, and that's a reflection of the people who work in the UAE. So these are largely individuals from other nations, expatriates who are going to be young. So uh, we need to see how effective this vaccine could be in the elderly. There've been no serious adverse events reported in the phase one or two trials. We don't know the results from the phase three, but the cost is expected to be low. It's an inexpensive type of vaccine to manufacture. Uh, and perhaps Dr. Uh, LaRusso will touch a little bit upon some historic problems with whole and activated viral vaccines. It's currently approved uh, in the UAE and in Bahrain. Next slide, please. The Moderna vaccine is a, the mirror image of the Pfizer vaccine. It is also an RNA, uh, messenger RNA vaccine. It also expresses the spike protein. Uh, and that seems to be key, as we'll talk about um, as we look at the other vaccines, inducing immune responses to the spike protein of the COVID or SARS-CoV-2 COVID viruses uh, seems to be the critical uh, image in manufacturing these vaccines. It's uh, got the advantage over the Pfizer vaccine is, is that it needs to be stored at minus 20 instead of minus 70, but it can be maintained uh, safely in refrigeration for up to 30 days. Uh, two intramuscular doses, in this case, uh, 28 days apart, four weeks. We do know that it's got good uh, immune responses, uh, including the, in the elderly. And uh, just as with the Pfizer vaccine, we're looking at, uh, in this case, 94.5% efficacy. No serious adverse events in any of the trials to date. Again, expensive, and uh, it will be reviewed by the um, U.S. Food and Drug Administration tomorrow and we expect approval of this vaccine for emergency use by December 19th. Um, so another vaccine that's um, shown to be highly effective. Uh, next, vaccine, uh, next slide, please. Uh, another Chinese vaccine, um, a different type of strategy, the CanSino Biologic, their AD5 vaccine. This is where they've used a viral vector strategy where they take a adenovirus and insert into it the gene for the spike protein. And when immunized, the spike protein is expressed and uh, the uh, subject who receives the vaccine mounts an immune response. It's uh, got the advantage of having uh, standard refrigeration. It also has the advantage that at this point they plan to use a single dose. Uh, we know from a Lancet paper uh, that it does induce neutralizing and cellular immune response. But again, we have no specific data in the elderly. I should mention to those in the audience who aren't familiar with vaccine immunology that uh, one, one, once one starts getting old, uh, that their immune system doesn't work as well. And as a consequence, they don't tend to make the same robust immune responses to a vaccine 
that are seen in much younger individuals. Hence, the vaccines often are not as uh, efficacious uh, in older people. So looking specifically at the immune, immune response of the vaccines in older people is going to be important since the elderly are at increased risk for severe disease and death from COVID. We don't have any data at this point on uh, efficacy. Uh, in the phase one trials, there were no serious adverse events reported. Uh, the cost is expected to be low and it's currently has limited use in China and uh, it looks like there's also going to be some limited use in, in other nations. Next slide, please. Um, the Russian vaccine, the Sputnik V, uh, was the first vaccine reported to have effectiveness coming out of, out of Russia. Uh, there were no published data and that made it a little challenging to know how effective this vaccine was. They've taken a different strategy, which is interesting. Sometimes when one uses a viral vector, such as ADNO5 or ADNO26, uh, if you come back a second time, the host has already made an immune response to the vector. So they've made, taken the strategy of immunizing with a, um, a viral vaccine that's um, constructed using the adenovirus 26 vector with a spike protein and then boosting with an adeno5 construct. So it's a prime boost strategy using different vectors. Uh, it can be stored at refrigerator temperatures. They've also got a two dose regimen, hence the prime boost 21 days apart. Uh, we do know from data that's available online uh, and in one publication of the phase one studies, this was a very small number of people, that the vaccine did make good humor and cellular immune responses in phase one trials, again, in uh, younger people. Uh, it's been reported to have a vaccine efficacy of 91.4%. Data are available online, but not in medical journals, so it's not been peer reviewed they report no serious adverse events in their phase three trial, and that's good. And they indicate the cost will be less than $10 per dose. So far, the only country that's approved the vaccine is Russia. Uh, next slide, please. The AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine was developed in the United Kingdom. It also is a viral vector vaccine uh, using instead of a human adenovirus, they've selected one that's uh, found in chimpanzees. It also expresses a spike protein. It's stable in the refrigerator, a real advantage. Again, two doses, in this case, four weeks apart. We know it's immunogenic and we know it's immunogenic in people over 65 years of age. They have made some errors in their clinical trials. And, uh, and this is really regrettable. We're still struggling to understand exactly how efficacious this vaccine is. What happened in the trial was that there was a manufacturing error uh, in terms of the vials that were produced. And um, some of the vials contained half the dose, standard dose that was used. And uh, so what happened was that a number of individuals received a half a dose of the vaccine followed by a full dose. And then other people received two standard doses. And what happened is those that received the half dose followed by the full dose, it was 90% efficacious. But if you got the two standard doses, it was only 62% efficacious. We don't have specific data at this point on the efficacy in older people. So we need a little more clarification on this. Nevertheless, its stability um, shows real promise and it's expected to be a very low cost vaccine. Uh, and in the phase two, three trials, there were no serious adverse events reported. Early on, there was a report of transverse myelitis in somebody participating in the study. We have to assume that may have been a placebo recipient. It is being considered at the moment for use in the UK, uh, but it's a very promising construct if we can better understand just how efficacious it is. Next slide, please. Uh, the Johnson & Johnson Deaconess um, vaccine is uh, produced in the United States. It uses the ADNO26 vector. Uh, so they go with a single vector system. Also the spike protein, standard refrigeration. Their initial trials have been looking at a single dose of the vaccine, but they're also now expanding those studies to look at two doses. You can see it's got good immune responses, uh, including in the elderly and in interim analysis. The final results are expected next month. Uh, so far, no serious adverse events. We don't know what the cost is. Uh, but because it's a uh, viral vectored one, the cost should be much less than we're seeing around the um, 
the RNA vaccine. So this one shows real promise. If it turns out to be highly efficacious following a single dose, this could be a favored vaccine um, because of its convenience in um, terms of only a single dose and because it requires standard uh, refrigeration. Next slide, please. I wanted to mention the Indian vaccine. This is another whole inactivated vaccine. Uh, as I mentioned to you, sometimes people don't make such great immune responses to whole inactivated vaccines combined with just an alimagivant. But what they've done instead is add uh, a very potent TLR agonist that is known to uh, significantly enhance immune responses. So it's a strategy that's um, uh, the only one in phase three development at this point requires standard uh, refrigeration, two doses, three weeks apart. We have no data on immunogenicity. We have no data on safety. And they've reported that they should have efficacy data by 2021. We don't know what the cost will be. Uh, but this, uh, because of standard refrigeration uh, and the potential ease of manufacturing, uh, and given that India is very good at producing vaccines, this could be a very promising option. Next slide. And I uh, wanted to mention the Novavax because it's a different type of strategy. This is also one uh, produced by a company in the United States. It focuses on the spike protein, but the protein by itself as opposed to delivering it through vectors or through genetic and uh, through uh, uh, RNA or DNA platforms. Uh, they're able to link this to a nanoparticle and uh, add a very potent adjuvant that's their proprietary adjuvant. It takes standard refrigeration, two dose again, regrettably. We know it's immunogenic, no data in the elderly. They expect results early in the new year. So far, no adverse events. Um, so if the cost is low, uh, this could also be a promising option. Uh, so far, no approvals because we have no efficacy data. Next slide, please. Um, I'm just gonna end with this one. Um, this is a series of other vaccines and uh, that are also in phase three. They very have very similar types of platforms with the exception of the Japanese one, which is a DNA platform. Um, but you can see that uh, these 16 are all in advanced stages and we expect early in the new year to have efficacy data on all of the remaining ones. Next slide, please. So that sort of summarizes where we are with the 16 vaccines in development and I uh, hope this gives you some hope that very shortly we're going to have a variety of different vaccines available to help us all get uh, this uh, terrible pandemic under control. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sternberg. That was a really, really uh, uh, succinct presentation uh, to walking us through what is um, uh, either uh, already out in, uh, as um, for um, um, emergency authorization and other things with other vaccines that are also in the pipeline uh, through phase, uh, phase three clinical trials. Really, really enlightening presentation. And I've already have seen questions coming through, so we'll be able to direct those questions. So our next presenter is gonna be uh, Professor Omo Nzala. Uh, Omo, uh, if you can hear me, uh, are you able to uh, hear us and present? Yeah, so thank you for inviting me uh, to be here and uh, discuss issues of COVID. COVID is a major problem. I hope, uh, Daniel, you can hear me well. Very well, go ahead. Yes, so the issue now is that we've just been introduced to the various uh, vaccines and I must say we are in totally unprecedented uh, time. We've been struggling for the HIV AIDS vaccine for the last 30 or so years, but you can actually be able to see that uh, uh, COVID has been different. Now the issue is that, is Africa ready? And in the recent review, beginning just to find out whether Africa is really ready uh, to roll out these vaccines, uh, Africa on average came out with 33% in readiness. Now clearly telling us that uh, uh, as a whole African countries are not there. There were some that are, were close to 33, but to be to safely and effectively roll out our COVID vaccines, we need a, a readiness index of about 80%. That is actually the target. So really what we are hearing 
is that uh, Africa needs to put its acts together and move very fast. And what are some of the parameters they look at? Really, the issue is to look at adequate plans for resource and funding. This, as you have been told, the vaccines that are being uh, uh, undergoing emergency use authorization now are not going to come cheap. The second thing is the issue of logistics. Can we really be able to receive these vaccines in Africa and distribute them and actually give them out? And again, you've seen issues of uh, storage has been a problem. Then the next thing is coordination structures, just ensuring that you have a proper coordinating mechanism where uh, people who know exactly what to do when these vaccines arrive, where do they go? Do we have good storage? Even if you are talking about just the standard refrigeration, coordination must be there. And then tools for data collection and monitoring. These vaccines are still very new. We must continue collecting data, much more data than we collect under routine vaccination. And then the other issue is just communica communication plans for building trust. And then the other issue is selection of priority populations and plans how to reach them. We know how to reach children because we've been giving vaccines to children for a long time. These vaccines are going to be given in a totally different population. So these are some of the parameters, ladies and gentlemen, that they look at. There are many other more, but Africa came out at only 33% in readiness. So we need to act and act fast. Then the issue is access to COVID-19 tools, what we are calling the ACT Accelerator. And this one is actually a global uh, collaboration. It has three pillars. The aims of the ACT Accelerator access to COVID tools aims to bring the acute phase of this pandemic to an end, and a quick end. And the three pillars are this innovative and equitable access to diagnostics, that is pillar one, to treatment, but I should say treatment as management, because I don't want people to think of only drugs, but management, that is pillar two. And then pillar three is the vaccines, COVAX. You are aware, ladies and gentlemen, we have had major problems with diagnostics, shortages, issues of supply chain, we are not out of there yet. So these three pillars are still critical. In terms of uh, uh, management and treatment, clinical trials have been going on to ensure that uh, drugs can be brought forth, but just standard things to ensure that we can have isolation facilities, we can have well-trained healthcare professionals, we can have access to oxygen when it is needed. This is another huge pillar because COVID has not gone away. And then the topic of today is vaccines. So what is COVAX? And really COVAX is a facility uh, that is trying to really assist African countries. And African countries must actually join and be members uh, to this facility. It brings together African CDC, uh, the Vaccine Alliance, brings together CEPI, brings together World Bank, brings together the African Export Import Bank, brings in Gavi and WHO. And there are many other uh, members uh, to, this, uh, uh, to this COVAX facility. And the aim is really to maximize the chance of people in participating countries, because African countries must join, getting access to COVID vaccines fairly, uh, as well as safely. And the issue of fairly, is the issue of a fair deal, fair deal. You have already heard costs are high. African countries may have problems accessing this. So really COVAX facility is there to ensure fair and safe, and safe access to these products, vaccines, as soon as they become available. And the whole issue then is, what vaccine would be appropriate for Africa? actually will depend on these issues and many more. Funding, costs involved, the cold chain, 
Are we also just going to use a, the, the, we pick a vaccine of standard uh, cold chain? But even if it's standard cold chain, this standard cold chain should not disrupt the ongoing childhood vaccination. And then the distribution networks and the follow-up of vaccinees. You have already seen that most of these vaccines come in two doses. And just to give you an example in the discussions we've been having, Kenya is a member of COVAX. We have already started looking at priority populations in Kenya. We are talking of frontline healthcare workers. We are talking of individuals with comorbidities. We are talking of the elderly. We are talking of teachers. And if you just look at this priority population for now, it is approximately 11 million. And then for Kenya, then if you took look at 11 million, you're asking yourself, the vaccine, how many doses? If there were two, maybe 24 million. The vaccinators, how many do we need to vaccinate 11 million people? And then the vaccinees, how do we reach them? And the issue is that how long will it take? If we really got this vaccine to give 11 million people, how long will it take? The longer it takes, the problems because of fatigue. So these are the issues, gentlemen, we must engage ourselves in and we must begin to discuss. Answers are not going to come from Europe. As we have seen, uh, COVID is live. We learn as we implement. These discussions must be discussed with Africans and by Africans and by ourselves. The next big problem is obstacles to, va to vaccine rollout in Africa. Problem of funds, even if vaccines are availed to us, we need funds for the logistics at home here, all right? But again, there will be another problem of insufficient global supply of vaccines, just the way we have seen with the commodities to do with testing. There's been a major problem. I see it on the National COVID Task Force here in Nairobi in Kenya, and we have had major problems where we have you know, supply chain problems. There are periods of time when we cannot even test. I foresee a similar problem with a global supply of vaccines. And then the other issue is poor and or lack of cold chain logistics. And then the issue of lack of community engagement. And that will be talked about, but the issue of beginning to engage early and preparing to create demand for this immunization, these are some of the obstacles that we must begin to look at clearly as we think of rolling out uh, uh, COVID vaccines in Africa, because we are not rolling out in the populations we have always known, because we have always dealt with children, but now it's a totally different ball game. So engagement and preparation and creating demand is going to be critical earlier now. And then the issues of, uh, does Africa need uh, a COVID vaccine? This question must be asked, ladies and gentlemen. Our epidemic has been different from country to country. In Kenya, for example, over 80% of our individuals are asymptomatic, all right? So does Africa need a COVID vaccine? And again, this is a discussion we must have. Europe should not make this decision for us. And this decision must, be de uh, must depend on our own evidence, on our own observation, on the way we are living, on the way we are observing the outbreak in this country. Those are questions. Will it stop the cycle of COVID transmission? Will it save lives? Will it accrue any cost benefits? if this vaccine is going to be introduced in Africa. What else must we bring in as we ask this particular question? Who should we vaccinate? And will it accrue all these things? So again, it should not just be an open blanket just because there is a vaccine out there, then Africa needs it. We critically looked at uh, influenza vaccine not too long ago with some of our postgraduates. And we went through very critical modeling and asking ourselves, these hard questions. And at the end of the day, we realized that really uh, uh, an influenza vaccine might not really be of use in Kenya at this point in time. 
even if we say that should we only vaccinate uh, uh, at risk populations like pregnant women and young children because of all issues of cost benefits, the disease burden, all these things must come to bear. And these are discussions, ladies and gentlemen, we must ask ourselves. Then the next thing is that, uh, what should Africa do? Really, what we need is to establish mechanism in action to really look at our, 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 risk, our outbreak very, very critically. You have actually realized that from country to country, the experience is different. So you, you are not going to use somebody else's data to make your own decision, okay? Africa must begin to think seriously about funding its own SARS-CoV-2 research rather than waiting for others to do that. And then the other question is that we must think long-term. We have had two outbreaks. First of all, we have four uh, coronavirus that are human that are circulating. We have had two outbreaks. We had an outbreak of coronavirus, SARS-CoV-1, if I may call it so, in 2002 in Asia. This, this particular uh, virus never went out of Asia. Then we have, we had Moscow in the Middle East. Again, this virus never really moved out of uh, the Middle East, but it has remained endemic in the Middle East. So the question is that, is SARS-CoV-2 going to become endemic in some parts of the world? And if so, what kind of plans should Africa be thinking? Because this must be, must be long-term. And then gentlemen, uh, let me end there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Zara. That was very captivating, just uh, you know, setting the context that uh, what goes on in a different uh, geographical setting and um, a given pandemic situation is, is really relevant to understand uh, in its entirety. You know, what are the obstacles? What are the barriers? What kind of vaccines would be ideal in Africa? And as you speak, I think this also applies to uh, most of the low, in, low to middle income uh, countries. So these are really pertinent questions and thanks for uh, bringing up that very clearly. So the next presenter is gonna be Dr. Larusa, who's gonna take us through uh, the safety aspects of the COVID vaccines. So please go ahead. Thank you, Daniel. Let's see. Can you see my, um, my screen? Yes, yes I can. All right, so I'm gonna to talk to you about what we know at this point in time and about vaccine safety. And I picked a number of platforms to talk about so we get a, a sense of what some of the issues are with these vaccines. Obviously, this is going to be an ongoing uh, uh, issue that we'll study. Dr. Stanberry has already gone through uh, the number of vaccines uh, that are out there. Uh, these are the ones that are just in phase three clinical trials. I'm gonna to try to tell you about the ones where we have a reasonable amount of safety information. And you all know about the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, uh, which uses a messenger RNA technology and lipid nanoparticles. And we'll talk about why that's important uh, a little later on. So we have pretty good phase three studies uh, phase three data on safety here. And uh, we, we even have uh, phase three uh, safety data on about 38,000 part uh, participants with a median follow-up of about two months. So we, we have a pretty good idea about immediate post-vaccine safety. And the most common solicited adverse events were injection site reactions, fatigue, headache, muscle pain, chills, joint pain and fever. Uh, it's important to know that in this, uh, in the Pfizer trial, people with a history of anaphylaxis were excluded from enrollment, but when they looked, about, looked at about 23,000 people in the safety population, it seemed like the number of hypersensitivity report related events was about the same as it was in the um, uh, placebo group. There were two cases of anaphylaxis, one in the vaccine group and one in the placebo group. These were thought to be due to other causes. One was due to a bee sting and one was due to an ant bite. Severe adverse reactions, those that are grade three or greater were relatively uncommon 
and they sort of mirrored what we saw in uh, my first slide. They were more frequent after dose one than after dose two, and they, uh, I'm sorry, they're more frequent after dose two than after dose one, and they were more frequent in the younger population uh, than in the older population. The frequency of serious adverse events, so uh, these are adverse events that result in some sort of medical intervention, uh, that was low in both groups. Uh, some things to watch, there were some unsolicited adverse events that were recorded. There were four cases of Bell's palsy in the vaccine group, and there were none in the placebo group. So obviously, this is something that we'll have to watch as time goes on. When they did the calculations, four, four cases in the vaccine group is about the, the frequency that you would expect in the general population. And I, I think it's important to recognize that even, and this is true of all the vaccines, even though there's uh, emergency use authorization has been granted for this product, the vaccine will continue to, to undergo further study until it's licensed under a formal agreement with the US FDA and other uh, agencies. So what happened then? So this was, you know, uh, Great Britain approved the vaccine about a week or so before the U.S. They vaccinated about 15,000 people, and there were two cases of anaphylaxis in the general population who got vaccinated. Both were healthcare workers. Both had a history of prior anaphylaxis. Uh, the other, um, as Dr. Stanberry mentioned, they even carried epinephrine pens around uh, with them. Uh, so uh, they, they did well and they both recovered completely. But the problem with this is that initially uh, the UK's recommendation was that anybody who had a history of a se severe uh, allergic reaction to anything should not get vaccinated. And you can imagine that caused a lot of consternation and worry because that is a significant portion of the population. And there was no guidance about what sort of uh, adverse events. They quickly backed off on that. And I'm gonna show you the uh, algorithm that the, the US FDA and CDC are using uh, to sort of adjudicate this. And if you look on the lower right-hand corner in the box, obviously if you've had a severe allergic reaction like anaphylaxis to any component of the Pfizer vaccine, you should not get vaccinated. So obviously second doses in people who had anaphylaxis with the first. Uh, this is a little bit more nuanced because there are uh, a number of stabilizers in this vaccine that are related to polyethylene uh, glycol polysorbate 80. And some of those are uh, compounds that related compounds can be found, found in like bowel prep um, um, preparations and people have reported allergic reactions to those. So there's gonna have to be an information sheet to give people more guidance about this category. In the middle box on uh, in the lower box in the middle in yellow, if you know the guidance is if you've had a severe allergic reaction to another vaccine, but not the Pfizer vaccine, not the Pfizer COVID vaccine, or you have a history of severe allergic reaction to an injectable agent, then you know the provider does an assessment. Uh, you may defer the vaccine. If you decide to go ahead with the vaccination, then you keep them around for 30 minutes so that if they do develop an allergic reaction, you can deal with it. It goes without saying, uh, you know, the, the guidance has been that this has to be done in a setting where you have the, the personnel and the materials to handle allergic reactions. And as importantly as these other two categories is this third category in the lower left-hand corner is that people who've had allergic reactions to other things not related to vaccines, injectable agents, can get the vaccine, uh, in, including food allergies, family history of anaphylaxis, things like that. And they're to be watched in the appropriate setting for a 15 minute period of time. So this at least gives us some guidance on how, how to do this in a safe way. And obviously as these studies go on, we'll get, we'll get more information about this. 
I'm not going to spend much time on the Moderna vaccine because, as Dr. Stanbury said, this is um, really a mirror image of the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, and this will be reviewed tomorrow at the FDA. And, and we think that uh, emergency use authorization will uh, come quickly after that. Uh, as with the Pfizer vaccine, uh, injection site uh, reactions were common after first, second dose, the usually mild and transient. And with the, as with the Pfizer vaccine, most of these happened on day one or day two and then um, were gone. Uh, grade three events, again, were uh, uncommon. I've listed them before. Injection site, pain after the first dose, fatigue, myalgia, arthralgia, headache, and pain and erythema at the injection site were seen after the second dose. And again, these were mostly uh, things that did not last for a, a period of time. So we've talked a little bit about the AstraZeneca vaccine. I think this is an important uh, vaccine to talk about, both because of its ease of use, if it eventually becomes licensed and used, but also because of this issue of the vector. And Dr. Stanberry alluded to, do, to this with um, the idea of an adenovirus vector. You may remember that in some of the initial HIV trials, there was in the subset analysis, it looked like people who had prior immunity to adenovirus were actually more likely to get infected with HIV than um, uh, people who were adenovirus serology negative before vaccination. I know there's some controversy about this data, but uh, in, in, in sort of to avoid this issue, the thought was, well, we'll use uh, a chimpanzee adenovirus that it's unlikely that people will have um, uh, prior immunity to. This vaccine also used uh, another approach in that they used another vaccine as the placebo, so the meningo quadrivalent vaccine. And the, the beauty of this in a way is that this is a vaccine that has uh, you know, side, side effects and adverse effects after the first, uh, and, uh, first and second dose. And the, the idea about this is that there's more benefit than getting a, a, a saline placebo, but also uh, the groups are gonna be more easily balanced and it's gonna be uh, easier to keep these two groups um, blinded in the study because you can't just say, well, the ones that had the reactions got the COVID vaccine and the ones that didn't got the placebo. So I, I think once the data gets sorted out uh, with this on the actual efficacy and especially the efficacy in older individuals, we'll go back and talk about this. It's also important uh, to note that most of the uh, side effects that are reported are from the phase one and two trial, and they're mostly after the first dose. So we have relatively little information uh, after the second dose, but that will be coming soon. Um, there were 70, 175 se uh, severe effect, uh, adverse events. Uh, they were uh, sort of equally divided between vaccine and placebo group. Uh, and again, uh, there were two, I should mention, there were two placebos, two controls in this study. One was a saline and one was the meningo vaccine. There were three events that were classified as possibly related to vaccine or control vaccine. One was the transverse myelitis, uh, actually after a COVID vaccine booster that Dr. Stanberry mentioned. An independent panel looked at that and thought that this was most likely to be idiopathic and not related to the vaccine. There was a, a case of hemolytic anemia after the meningo vaccine and a high fever in a participant uh, who is masked and still masked and we don't know what that participant received but that person did receive a second dose without incident. As in any trial, there were a number of other events uh, thought not to be related to vaccine. There were four, uh, four deaths in the trial, three in the control groups, and one in the, back, in the COVID vaccine arm. So again, we'll continue to look at this. So this is the Chinese uh, uh, inactivated vaccine by Beijing uh, Institute of Biologics. 
it's inactivated with uh, beta propion lactone and it has aluminum hydroxide as an adjuvant. Uh, it, we have data from phase one and two trials uh, and uh, in different age groups, although the safety data is mostly in the younger people. Uh, most commonly injection site pain was seen, fever and, and, and fatigue, most of this was mild. There was some look at la laboratory abnormalities and there wasn't anything clinically significant here. So this is something that will continue to be looked at. I, one of the things uh, you, you, you think about when you think about inactivated vaccine is the possibility of enhanced disease on exposure to the disease, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, aluminum hydroxide as an adjuvant, there are instances where people have uh, had allergic reactions to aluminum hydroxide that presents as what looks like the, what are non-sterile abscesses at the point at the site of injection. So to finish up, what are the, what are the ongoing concerns? Um, we're encouraged by the safety data that we have from the phase two and, and early phase three trials. Obviously we need to keep looking at this. So what's this issue of enhanced disease and vaccinees after exposure? Well, we have some history with this, right? With killed measles and killed RSV vaccines. When those children were exposed to uh, those pathogens after receiving killed vaccines, they had a uh, 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 disease of increased severity. There's some indication, and I know people are still thinking about this, with the dengue vaccine uh, in the Philippines that people uh, who had prior, um, who got the vaccine, a subset of them might have been at higher risk for severe disease and infection. So we'll continue to look at this. For the mRNA vaccines, uh, one of the questions has been mostly uh, a theoretical one. Uh, is it possible for the mRNA to get integrated and translated into host cell DNA and be per permanently there? What we know about this now is that that probably is not going to happen. The data that are available show that the mRNA hangs RNA hangs around for a period of hours and uh, the glycoprotein for a period of, of days. It doesn't get into the nucleus and we think this is not gonna be a problem. Uh, with the adenovirus vectored vaccine, we've talked about this, so I won't go into this anymore in any more detail, uh, we'll, but we'll have to look at this in subset analysis of larger groups of people. There was one unusual finding uh, with uh, a vaccine out of Australia where the vaccine had to be withdrawn because people who subsequently got HIV antibody tests uh, were uh, turning positive on their HIV antibody test. And when they went back and looked at the composition of the vaccine, the molecular clamp that they used to hold the spike protein in place had a small component which is derived from fragments of HIV glycoprotein 41, and that was resulting in false positive HIV antibody test. Uh, so that vaccine was uh, withdrawn. So the, the final two issues that I'll finish up with is that people have really wanted to continue the phase three trials to get as much information about efficacy and safety in a rigorous manner. And uh, there are real questions about what the effect of unblinding is on the control groups. Obviously, people who are in risk groups or first responders that need to get vaccinated will be unblinded at the time they're ready for vaccination and will get the vaccine if they're needed, if it's needed. I think it, finally that the, the phase four post-marketing studies, those, those studies that go on after vaccines are approved uh, are critical to look at long-term outcomes, rare adverse events, and any events of special interest. So to be continued, and I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. LaRosa. Again, that was uh, brilliant, uh, you know, providing that detailed review of the safety profiles of the vaccines and also looking forward to, you know, how uh, you know, some of the safety concerns um, of the various platforms uh, very, very insightful indeed. Thanks so much.
Uh, the, our final presenter today is going to be Dr. Uh, Amo. So um, Dr. Amo will be talking about vaccine assistance, vaccine diplomacy, and the uh, vaccine national. Again, setting this context here, you know, the vaccines, are, as we heard from uh, Dr. Stanbury, there are a lot of vaccines in the pipeline, but are these going to are going to be acceptable? Are we going to have good uptake? And what are some of the concerns? So please, Dr. Amo. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Okiel. And I want to thank uh, CGC Tunis and CGC Nairobi for giving me the opportunity to speak. I'll try to be brief uh, in the interest of time so that we can have time for questions at the end. Uh, but today, uh, as Dr. Okiel just mentioned, I'm going to be talking about vaccine sustainability, collaboration, and diplomacy, and how this can help um, think about rollouts and what are the major threats that we have now. Um, that we actually have developed these vaccines. So this has been an unprecedented effort, like Dr. Larry uh, Stanberry said, that it has never happened that we've developed a vaccine so quickly. Uh, the first case was in, in uh, Wuhan in December of 2019. And now at the end of uh, 2020, we have several candidates that will be rolled out. So unfortunately, there are challenges uh, to the uptake. And the first one that I will be presenting is this new concept of vaccine nationalism. Um, so there's been an unprecedented and self-defeating effort linking vaccine development to national identities. And so this word vaccine nationalism or vaccine nationalism, as it's sometimes being called, uh, has, has propped up. So it has never happened in the last hundred years that the entire world was plagued by the same uh, infectious disease at the same time under such intensity. And so all of the researchers thinking about uh, finding solutions and developing vaccines. So it's not uncommon now that you hear the vaccines that were presented by um, Dr. Stanberry in the first presentation as actually uh, the Chinese vaccine, the Russian vaccine, the Indian vaccine, the American vaccine. So that's a new concept we've never had to deal with before. Uh, and obviously this is going to be counterproductive in promoting collaboration, uh, in sharing uh, data, results, progress, and obviously also uh, global access as I will talk about. So uh, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres put it really well. He says some countries are reportedly making side deals exclusively for their own populations. And the country that we're currently in, uh, Dr. Larusa Stanberry and I, the United States, definitely is one of those countries. So this is a pure example of vaccine nationalism. It's not only unfair, it is self-defeating. So this idea that first we will think about our population and then we will worry about what happens in the world. But as uh, Antonio Guterres reminds us, no, none of us is safe until all of us are safe. Ultimately, vaccine nationalism is a threat to global security. As nations embark on bilateral arrangements with the US, Russia, and China around vaccines, or even with multinational companies. So let me show you what I mean by that. Um, some of these have been presented by uh, Dr. Stanberry in the first presentation, and I'm showing you something, again, that has been unheard of. A lot of these vaccines, before we even knew uh, whether they were efficacious or not, had actually been pre-ordered. Uh, pre-ordered because they were pre-made. AstraZeneca, for example, was producing doses in the million before they knew that their vaccine was working. And again, this has never been done before. Um, but what's really interesting is the following is that actually some of the countries have been purchasing or have been making deals or side deals or bilateral agreements with the manufacturers in order to procure uh, some of these vaccines at an order of magnitude that just doesn't make sense in terms of uh, the population. So the, the, you can look at the three countries at the top. Canada, for example, has already pre-ordered a magnitude of eight times uh, the number of uh, its population in terms of doses of COVID-19 vaccine. The United States, uh, between pre-ordered and potential for an expansion and deal, uh, also close to eight and United Kingdom uh, close to six. And if you look all the way down, you see that COVAX, which was introduced by Dr. Anzala in the second presentation, which is actually a disbursement uh, mechanism to provide low and middle income countries uh, access to those same vaccines at a, at a either for free or at a lower uh, price uh, is, is not part of these agreements. So the question is, why do Canada, United States and United Kingdom basically need to hoard all of these vaccines because the need for the population is not going to be there. Canada already responded by saying that uh, some of these vaccines that they 
pre-ordered and purchased will actually be part of global cooperation and then they will go back to the low and middle income countries but you can see that uh, that is going to be a problem in terms of the supplies because if all of these vaccines stay in uh, those four or five countries uh, Europe and, and, and North America it will be a problem of supply so in order to counter vaccine nationalism, uh, there is now this idea of vaccine diplomacy. And that's exactly what the COVAX project was, was developed for, um, which was introduced again by Dr. Anzal in the second presentation. So uh, not only to promote equity and justice, as he uh, justly mentioned, but also to promote vaccine security between nations. And so I will show you that it can occur at two levels. The first one, it fosters international scientific cooperation uh, and R&D support for joint COVID-19 vaccine development and improvement. So this is sometimes referred to as vaccine science diplomacy. And the best example of that is uh, in the middle of the Cold War, the uh, scientists from the United States and the Soviet Union were allowed to collaborate on the development of an oral polio vaccine. And this is really something that we're trying to uh, replicate now, as it seems a lot of the countries are trying to go against each other in the development of, this, of these vaccines. Um, and so COVAX allows this cooperation so that results and encouraging results from one trial uh, or one country can be immediately shared so that it, it benefits the international community. Uh, the other one is a science diplomatic effort around international sharing of clinical trial and vaccine efficacy and monitoring data. Um, obviously, we have known with the Pfizer and the Moderna uh, trials that uh, th this, this data is kept uh, confidential until the moment that is published. And uh, this could hamper the development of, of, of other vaccines. So vaccine science diplomacy will help to diffuse a situation in which new innovative platforms predominantly benefit North America and Europe, whereas low and middle income countries may receive only partial access to adenovirus and mRNA vaccines while relying significantly on traditional whole inactivated virus and recombinant protein vaccines. So it is a major issue, of course, that the two first vaccines that have been approved uh, are vaccines that right now, as was mentioned in previous presentations, are just not suitable for rollout or at least massive rollout in uh, low and middle income countries. So it leaves the choice for these countries with limited vaccines. There are many in the pipeline, but they will not have access to all of them. And these vaccines are going to be made available in a drip basis. One will come out, will be made available, will be approved, and it will be really complicated for COVAX to, dis to determine among all of the countries that they are covering which country will get access to this vaccine. And when multiple vaccines are being approved, uh, how do you split the different vaccines? Which vaccine will go to Kenya? Which vaccine will go to Uganda? And, and at what proportion? So the second issue uh, is around communication about the vaccine, its safety, the fastness of its development. Um, so we have noted in recent years that people's trust in institutions is lower than it had previously been. So it's making the global governance and vaccine task really difficult. Um, I'm not going to tell you that social media is replacing traditional forms of communication. We used to get information from radio, newspaper, uh, television. Now it is replaced by uh, Facebook and WhatsApp and Twitter. And that obviously introduces a, a, a real danger because this type of uh, information is just not scrutinized as much and any type of uh, conspiracy theory can, can easily um, be disseminated. So there are multiple streams of information which can be curated to disseminate facts or advance specific agendas regardless of whether they are based in truth. So it will be important to get the full and most robust story about cutting edge products delivered to people all over the globe in a manner that rebuilds lost trust. It's actually really important to share. Um, examples of the vaccinations in the UK and the US to show um, what kinds of population are being vaccinated, the people are being vaccinated. And I think it's also important to discuss if there are side effects so the, the, the people are realizing that we are reporting on, on what's going on. Agreements to control disinformation that harms these efforts should be established amongst members of the global health governance organization and such information warfare should be viewed as acts of public health aggression. And at the same time, reporting and enforcement structures should be established for legitimate issues regarding product efficacy, safety, and discriminatory, corrupt, or wasteful practices in product allocation and in global health government bodies. And I do think that these types of initiative would really help with the public's 
uh, trust in, in, in these vaccines because ultimately this will be uh, very important. So that leads me to my next section, which is vaccine hesitancy. And here I am showing the vaccination intention over time between March and December. Uh, the proportion intending to receive vaccines ranged basically between 42 and 66%. And you can see that even after the announcement of the efficacy of the Pfizer vaccine, um, the intention of vaccination has not increased to 100%. And just out of reference, uh, we would probably need an uptake of 70 to 80% uh, in order to reach that notion of herd immunity so that the, the vaccination is actually uh, helpful in protecting uh, everyone. There is another problem, which is uh, disparity within populations about whether or not they would want to uh, get vaccinated. And we're not going to go into the historical details. These are uh, results from the United States, but you can see in yellow, um, the uh, Black African American population uh, is actually distrusting at the moment of the safety uh, of the vaccination and whether they will uh, whether there will be uptake. So that is a, a, a an actual problem because in the United States, uh, African Americans are disproportionately affected by uh, COVID-19, both in terms of morbidity, but also in terms of mortality. So the communication will be extremely important to show uh, that these vaccines are safe and uh, efficacious. And to go to a, a, a final step, not only is there hesitancy, but there is also refusal. And uh, there has been an acceleration of COVID-19 vaccine refusal uh, in the United States, led by committed opposition groups and activists. And some are connected to far-right political extremism. And over the summer of 2020, they helped to ignite protests against COVID-19 prevention, which is now spreading well outside of the United States into Europe and, and, and also uh, in parts of Africa. These anti-vaccine activities contribute to declines in vaccine security and demand broad-based international action. This means promoting and distributing adequate public messages on the efficacy and safety of the COVID-19 vaccines, ensuring mechanisms and diffusing or dismantling anti-vaccines propaganda and interference from anti-vaccine groups. I think that this will be a really important step uh, in at the national level and at the international level to understand, to get the pulse of the nation, to get the pulse of the population to understand what are the fears, what are some of the conspiracy theories that are going around and dismantle them so that when the vaccine vaccines are actually available in the various countries that people are not worried about getting vaccinated. So in conclusion, uh, vaccine, vaccine nationalism threatened to unravel our vaccine ecosystem in 2020, unnecessarily politicizing vaccines and vaccine access. Concurrent with promotion of vaccine diplomacy is recognizing how the world faces an imminent threat from an aggressive anti-vaccine confederacy and anti-vaccine activities thwart the current and future success of COVID-19 vaccination and risk that COVID-19 transmission will continue for years to come. And actually, uh, Dr. Anzala was making reference to that. There, we, we still have now an opportunity to eradicate COVID-19 with vaccines that have 95% efficacy. Um, but if there is no uptake or if some countries are not able to get access to it because the vaccines are being hoarded by uh, Europe and North America, COVID-19 will become endemic. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Amo. Again, that was uh, brilliant, uh, taking us through uh, some of the issues, the dynamics in equity in COVID vaccine and also uh, highlighting some of the challenges that we are likely to face with uh, hesitancy and refusal. That's, that's really great. So uh, we have a few minutes. There's so many exciting questions that have come through and we'll try to uh, push this to our respective panelists. What I will ask is just uh, the panelists keep their responses very, very brief so that we, we are able to cover these questions. And again, in the order uh, of the presentation, so maybe I'll start with uh, Dr. Stanbury. Uh, I think there was a question which you've already answered to some extent, but it's also good just to bring it out that um, when we talk about these vaccines, uh, you know, is there a vaccine or is there um, a goal for these vac vaccines actually to prevent viral infections as opposed to just preventing uh, the diseases? And I think this is also uh, ties up with the point that you wanted to raise earlier about the efficacy of these vaccines. What do they really mean? What are, what are we looking at in terms of uh, the, the desired efficacy of the vaccine 
and how will that impact, uh, uh, you know, the infection in the population? So please go ahead. Sure. No, it's a very complicated question, actually. Um, in general, vaccines, because of the way we design trials, look at prevention of disease, not prevention of infection. And interestingly enough, when it comes to antiviral drugs, for example, Food and Drug Administration isn't interested in things that prevent viruses, they're interested in things that prevent disease. So the whole orientation typically is towards, let's make sure people don't get sick. However, we recognize that people can not be sick, but can be contagious. And so the issue about preventing infection is let's make sure it's got a public health benefit as well as a personal benefit to the person who gets immunized. Uh, there's a little bit of data coming out on the um, Moderna vaccine indicating that it indeed appears to be reducing the likelihood of asymptomatic or preclinical infection. Can't find virus in these people. Um, whereas placebo recipients, you could find individuals who clearly got infected, had no symptoms. So I think we'll find out as we go along, just each of these vaccines is now being looked at in that regard. But so far, the only one we have any evidence that reduces the risk of actually being subclinically infected and hence potentially transmissible is the Moderna vaccine. It's likely that we're going to see the same kind of data coming out of the Pfizer vaccine because they, like we've said before, they look very much alike. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Stanberry. Uh, I will make come back uh, with a follow-up question, but let's let's take it to Professor Nzala again. Uh, two questions, actually. So the first one is again just um, uh, bringing forward uh, the reality that the pandemic in Africa is different from you know how it uh, plays out in Europe or, or USA. Uh, the age range that is affected is different. So the question is, uh, when you look at uh, particularly the, um, the, the young population that is being affected, how then do you prioritize uh, COVID vaccine in Africa? Would you consider this, uh, would it make sense, for example, to also think of this uh, vaccine to be availed to the elderly? <laughs> uh, thanks a lot for that. And it has been a good discussion. In fact, the, um... The, the whole issue, you remember, I talked about uh, the, the readiness index. And the whole issue is we are being led by a science. We have seen that we have a younger population, 85% or in some countries get infection, they remain asymptomatic. But we have a, seg a segment of those who are at risk of severe disease and death. And those are individuals with comorbidities. And these individuals actually are across the age group because you find diabetes, hypertension in even young people. So what we are now prioritizing is saying is that uh, for us in Kenya, for example, the first priority will be the frontline healthcare workers because they are at high risk of exposure and high risk of getting infected. Second group is those with comorbidities because they are at risk of getting infected, but more so at risk of severe disease and death. The third group is actually the elderly. So, and then we are also thinking because of the exposure to children, and we have seen in this country that children may get infected, but they actually don't get sick at all. So we are also beginning to look at teachers because in the next two, three months, we shall actually be opening our schools. So we are also beginning to look at teachers critically. So that is the priority that we shall start with. But eventually, really, we want to be able to go on and roll out this vaccine to the entire, to the entire population. And the, the question of, does Africa need a vaccine? The issue is that we must then create demand. We must then discuss and say that even if we start, eventually, we need that vaccine for this reason and that reason and the other reason. Because eventually, we want to see if uh, the possibility of ensuring that we actually eradicate you know, this approach. So we should not just take anything for granted. These issues must be discussed. These issues must be led with, with science. And that's exactly where we are. We are coming from. The group that is now looking at Kenya specifically, and Kenya, I can say, is part of the COVEX, is actually beginning to look at those aspects. So, Chair, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. And just, just actually to follow that, Follow up on that question. 
I think especially for Africa, the challenge has always been, you know, under, under reporting or under testing, you know, the challenges of testing. So when you now think of cost effectiveness of a COVID vaccine in Africa, how do you then uh, really bring out as a justification? You know, we, we are not testing adequately, we're probably not reporting adequately. And yet we think that the vaccine is gonna be the most important uh, intervention for COVID. Yeah, yeah, that is actually part of the of the of the issue. And you remember when I discussed about the ACT accelerator, yeah. one of the pillars that was there was what diagnostics. And there has been a problem with diagnostics also on the international market in terms of supply chain. So there is definitely more infection in Africa than has been reported. What we know is at least the morbidity and the mortality data could be closed because these individuals have all ended up in hospital. But the individuals who get infected and remain within the society without developing symptoms could actually be higher. But the discussion that are going on is that chances are, as we begin to bring in these vaccines, we may not be able to test in order to say those who are uh, serologically negative should receive the vaccine. No, 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 no. What I'm hearing is that we shall adjust, administer this vaccine regardless of, of, uh, of, of regardless of testing. So whether it will boost or whether it will enhance is an issue that came up here in discussion. But uh, so far, we have not uh, seen that happen. What we knew about measles enhancement, what we saw about uh, and dengue, what we saw about RSV is my understanding that those viruses, usually if there is anything to do with macrophages, it is usually through macrophages that they enhance disease, but we don't see a, a infection in macrophages. I might be, I stand corrected there, but we don't see infection in macrophages through that process of enhancement. But the idea is that we shall not test in order to roll out the vaccine. But at the same time, I think the, the question that we should also be asking ourselves and the discussions we must be asking is that at the moment in time, there's emergency use authorization going on in the UK, in the US and some other countries. Should Africa also follow the same or should Africa, Africa wait a little bit till more data is available, till more vaccines are available and then we can pick and choose what is totally appropriate for us. And that's why I want that discussion uh, to be held with African countries, because these things are not going to come in cheap. That's the position I'm coming in when I ask the question, does Africa need a COVID vaccine? It is not to say yes, but it's actually to discuss, agree, be led by a science, and actually create that demand that indeed Africa needs a COVID vaccine, and this is how we intend to administer. Priority populations first, then the rest of the population, depending on what science has actually told us. And that is local information from our own outbreak. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Zara. So um, I'm also gonna ask a question uh, that uh, Darusa, I, I think the issue of vaccine safety is, is quite complex. And as you've laid it out, you know, there is what you see in the clinical trials, you know, up to phase three, and then there's what you're going to uh, see in phase four uh, post licensure. Uh, but some questions are coming through in terms of real, real um, practical considerations. So uh, the questions about uh, people with liver transplant, you know, people with some very specific uh, conditions. But when you look at um, what we have currently, you know, uh, across the range of uh, vaccines that Dr. Stanberry described and also thinking ahead in terms of the platforms and, and um, uh, that we're going to roll out. Do you see any specific concerns, you know, so that you can actually make the point that for this category of patients, then this is, this is uh, you know, it would not be advisable to take this vaccine. So uh, what would you say about that? So um, let me see if I can group those people together and, and give you so the generic answers. and. Um, Obviously, it's going to depend on what vaccine and what country and what condition. But I, I think the safety data we have, even though it's very preliminary, is encouraging. Uh, we certainly want 
more information on people in immunocompromised populations. The data we have to date seems that uh, it looks like it's safe to vaccinate at least HIV infected individuals. Obviously we need, we need more data there. There have been concerns about uh, people with inflammatory conditions on anti-inflammatory drugs and biologic modifiers. And again, there's no theoretical reason why they would be a problem. Uh, but in both the first group and the second group, you have to also wonder about not only are there safety issues, uh, but are, are there gonna be efficacy issues too? What's the efficacy gonna be in those uh, two groups? Um, and, you know, obviously we alluded to the subset of individuals who have prior immunity to the adenovirus vectors. I think we need to be reassured about that. And then finally, although the preliminary data, you know, from people who have prior COVID vaccine infection looks good as, if, as though there's not going to be a problem, obviously we're talking about very small numbers. So I think right now what we're talking about in terms of who should not get the vaccine are people with severe allergic reactions to the components or related agents. And obviously that's gonna depend on which, which vaccine we're talking about. And I know we're running out of time, so I'll, I'll yeah. stop there, but obviously we need to talk about this again in six months and again in a year. Thank you very much, Dr. Arisa. Yeah, uh, and again, uh, Dr. Moore, um, you know, when, when you think about some of the equity issues that have come up with COVID, um, you know, whether it is, uh, you know, the, 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 the differences in um, regional um, uh, requirements for this vaccine and so on, whether they'll be available and readily accessible to a range of people. Do you see any unique um, considerations here for COVID uh, vaccine versus any other vaccine. So let's say HIV vaccine and TB and so on. What, what is the uniqueness here in terms of equity concerns for COVID? Uh, and uh, do you see this being um, resolved in some structured way, whether through COVAX um, or any other um, you know, platforms? Well, thank you. Um, well, I would say, let's take HIV out of it because, uh, well, we, we don't have a vaccine and that's really a subset of the population. I don't think you can compare. Uh, in this particular case for COVID, for example, uh, everybody would be and should be eligible. Um, one of the major differences that I see is that the, the, the vaccine vaccination systems that we have in place, and that also includes the United States, are typically vaccinations that happen uh, during childhood. So except for the flu, there isn't a vaccination system in uh, the develop, even the developed world that vaccinates adults in such a systematic way. And it definitely does not exist in low and middle income countries. So that would be a major difference. It's something that we have to think about. Uh, how do you develop a, a, a distribution system, a vaccination system that does not uh, jeopardize the already existing vaccination systems that are mostly for children. So in 2020, uh, it has been reported in low and middle income countries that uh, regular vaccination for children have significantly decreased, Sub-Saharan Africa, in India. And so you now see an increase in measles cases um, be because of that. So that would be, that would be my, my main, um, recommendations to try to find a system to provide these vaccines for adults in ways that we haven't thought about. So in the United States for the flu, for example, we are using uh, chains of pharmacy um, or, or workplace. So in the context of, you know, Africa, um, this could be done maybe it, depending on the vaccine, of course, if it's not Pfizer or Moderna, maybe using community health workers uh, that are specifically trained to go and, and, and dispense these vaccines if, if that was an option. Mm -hmm. And I have seen a question in the, in the chat box about yes. Russia and yes. COVAX yes. and uh, Russia is not part of COVAX and the US is not part of COVAX. So. Okay. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, and I just uh, also just quickly on, on um, uh, a question on the Q&A uh, chat box, uh, Dr. Amor. Uh, the AstraZeneca uh, are producing large uh, 
quantities of this vaccine, you know, before they fully understand what is the effect, uh, 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 eff efficacy profiles and so on. And the question is, when you look at how this is hastened effort um, towards uh, producing these uh, vaccines, do you anticipate that this is going to be the similar situation which we had with the H1N1 vaccine? So, so maybe the question could be more specific about what the situation is that the that he or she is referring to. But I will say this. So it, it, when I'm making reference to the um, production ahead of proven efficacy, um, that doesn't mean that these vaccines are going to be distributed and injected into arms, right? So the idea is that we have been in such an unprecedented situation in 2020 when the entire world has come to a, a shutdown, basically, um, because of this one infectious disease, that it was worth the financial risk to actually start producing a vaccine that you know people will want to use or you would hope that government will want to purchase and so if it shows that it's actually efficacious, then you can immediately start thinking about the distribution rather than wait another step, which is, okay, we have now shown in December that Pfizer and Moderna, hopefully AstraZeneca, if we figure out what happened with this dosage issue, are, are efficacious, that we don't now have to wait for the, the extra step of, of producing. And, and think about it, even with the productions that they started in July for AstraZeneca, and at some point uh, also in the summer for Moderna and Pfizer, we still don't have enough to vaccinate populations. So this is going to, it, it is definitely helping uh, in the context of developing, uh, developed nations to uh, vaccinate frontline health workers and the elderly, but it, it, it is not enough. So it was, it was a financial risk, but it was a risk that was worth it now that we obviously see that these efficacies are 95%. Are and if I can add another word, there is something that we haven't talked about, which is uh, the, the US's response, which is Operation Warp Speed, uh, in which they actually provided significant financial uh, incentives for companies to do R&D. Pfizer was not part of that but also uh, procurement. So the United States actually pre-purchased a lot of these vaccines or uh, uh, financially helped for the production of, of some of these vaccines in which Pfizer was one of them. And Moderna was both for the development and for uh, purchasing doses. So again, this has, this has never been done. And, and it could have been a, a complete disaster uh, financially, but now obviously it, it, it paid off. Thanks a lot, thanks a lot. Yeah, so again, just going back to the uh, panel, through the panel again, um, uh, Dr. Stanbury, and probably also Professor Anzala here. <clears throat> so we have seen the range of vaccines that are at different stages um, of development. And we have a virus that is still in the population, you know, and with all viruses, we know that they're changing and so on. Do you anticipate any uh, um, kind of challenges with the current I would say um, a stream of vaccines that are coming through, and what are some of the things that we should be thinking ahead in terms of, you know, making sure that the next generation of vaccines, if we, we may call them that, are aligned with the virology and, and the nature of our epidemic. Great question, Dr. Anzala. Do you want to lead, or you want me to go ahead? Yeah, go ahead, then I'll follow through. Thank you. Sure. Well, you, Dr. Dr. Anzala already indicated the answer, I think, which is that all parts of the world need to be looking at the sequencing viruses that are coming out of vaccine failures uh, to make sure that the issue isn't one of mutation that's led to uh, the vaccine becoming ineffective. Um, the, I think given the remarkable success we've seen, it could be possible to pivot. Certainly some of these platforms allow you to do that, the RNA in particular, but whole whole and activated as well. You just switch the seed virus you're going to use. So, but it's absolutely going to be critical to continue to monitor. So Dr. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And that's why I emphasize that uh, we must also be led by science. We must keep looking surveillance, looking at the viruses that are, are that are out there. So far, uh, just through uh, looking through literature, have, uh, they have uh, people who have been doing um, genetic fingerprinting. Uh, they are already saying that they are seeing some uh, mutations here and there. Whether they mean something, we don't know yet. But really, that's the kind of uh, 
information we we need. And also what I said, we don't know whether this virus, we will actually, with the vaccines that are there, I know in another one year, vaccines will definitely be available. We don't know whether we shall be able to wipe out this virus with vaccines or whether the virus will end up being endemic, just like influenza, where we have to keep at it and looking at it and making new uh, and, and new viruses. So definitely, OGL, this we must keep surveillance. And this surveillance can be country or can be regional, so that we keep feeding uh, the international community with our sequences, and they keep looking to see whether uh, whatever vaccines are coming out are really there. And also just studies to see whether uh, there is a, there are, there's a switch or whether the virus is actually mutating to the extent that there is a skin. So we cannot stop there just because there are vaccines, we cannot stop doing you know, the science to keep informing. And also ensuring that uh, with this information, we make better and better vaccines. Yeah, that's exactly what I, I see happening. Thank you. So, so the one thing, I, if I could comment, uh, the, the other thing, and you, you sort of touched upon this and certainly Dr. Amour did, the, the other issue is one of Africa's capability of doing its own manufacturing which is something you clearly need and, and have the intellectual capability. And the remarkable success of your Africa CDC in three years, what it's been able to accomplish when you're looking at the complete collapse of the US CDC is, is a real credit to you. So I, I you know, the, you, with regionalization occurring and hopefully it'll be accelerated as a consequence of this, I do hope that you'll have the capability in Africa to be producing your own vaccines. Yeah, actually, that's a good point because the, the, the mRNA uh, vaccines are giving us a very nice platform. And I can't say that Uganda has actually started working on mRNA vaccines. They are thinking of yellow fever, but that will be the kind of approach to take. Rather than going back to the traditional ways, we can actually jump the science and begin to say uh, the mRNA or maybe even re replicating mRNA the way African can do that. And also the point being is that uh, we are moving out of uh, many African countries are becoming middle class and very soon we shall not get subsidies from, you know, from Gavi. So how do we position ourselves to be able to do these things, you know, at home, even if it's not every country, but regional. So for, for me, really, these are questions we must ask ourselves, no matter how difficult, and then we must begin to look at partners. You see, we've talked quite a bit about vaccines, but we've not really talked about private sector. There's a thriving private sector in Africa. The banks are making money. There are other institutions that are, are making money. How do we then also bring them on board so they also participate in this process? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Uh, I'm just, uh, just seeing a comment and a question coming through very specifically around that. Is there any African country that is able to manufacture? 100%. South Africa. Tunisia, okay. Morocco, and probably Egypt. Ghana, yeah. Kenya, why not? <laughs> <laughs> Senegal. Senegal is Senegal. making a yellow fever vaccine and has That's been making right. yellow fever vaccine. Egypt makes bacterial vaccines. Mm -hmm. uh, Morocco does. So definitely the platform, the, the only issue is that can we move to the new you know, platforms? Because from what I'm understanding, you know, if these vaccines are going to be uh, approved, and they will be, that is a, the kind of technology that is going to take place. And I know the issue of the cold chain uh, science has always proved us right. Eventually things are difficult, but as more science comes in, eventually those cold chain issues can, can actually be resolved. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I, I see we are really coming close to the end of our uh, webinar here, but I um, really want to give also a chance to all of you uh, to kind of give your final reflection. This is still an ongoing uh, situation, so I'd like to give you that chance. But before I do that, uh, Dr. Larusa, what are some of the things that uh, regulators are, are going through? You know, when you see a pandemic, you see, um, you know, a number of vaccines being uh, tested at different stages. You are confronted with the data. You want to make sure that it's uh, expeditiously reviewed and it goes out. What are, what are some of the challenges or uh, key things that the reviewers are also, I mean, the regulators are at Grampoon? So this has been 
particularly trying for regulators because um, uh, in the US and in many countries, we do these in sequential uh, order. So, you know, uh, the company presents uh, the in vitro safety data. The FDA looks at that, says that's okay. Let's go on to animal studies. That's okay. Go on to the next step and the next step and the next step. Essentially what happened this in this uh, particular model is all of that happened in parallel and the regulators had to look at all of that data. Mm -hmm. So in some countries, what they do is they look at the, the company's summary reports and essentially take their word for what's going, what happened. In other countries, there are actually people that are going over the raw data, redoing all the efficacy and safety calculations, making sure that the groups are balanced. So it was a tremendous challenge. And I know a lot of the people and have served on these committees in the United States, and they're very rigorous about what they do. There's been a whole lot of talk about political pressure on the FDA and the CDC to get moving, but the, the people who are actually doing the work are doing really a tremendous job under very difficult situations. Thank you very much. Yeah, so finally, um, I, I'm just gonna give you maybe a minute or so uh, just to give your reflection you know, as you now look forward um, into the future, immediate future and the, and the kind of long uh, distance future, um, the vaccine, the pandemic, uh, the pandemic and, uh, and issues around equity. What are your thoughts? Uh, you know, what, what, what would you like to see? At least in the next one or, or uh, uh, two or three years from now. <clears throat> And let's start with uh, Dr. Mo. I thought I was going to be last again. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dr. Akhil. Well, I have to say, as much as has been uh, probably the worst year that all of us have had in our lifetime, uh, it's also been a rather inspiring year because you saw that a, a, a global issue that we didn't even know we were going to have on January 1st, we are now starting to see a solution uh, come December 31st. The, the world has come together in unprecedented ways, particularly on the science front, the research. There has been global cooperation. Uh, you know, 10 days after the virus was identified, the sequence was shared and people were able to work on diagnostics and people realized, oh, this is really close to the first SARS. So they started thinking about developing vaccines. People have to understand, obviously not the panelists today already know that, but people who are listening to us should know that another reason why it was possible to be so quick in the development of a vaccine is that the, the shared sequence with SARS-1 uh, is so great that there is 13 years worth of thoughts and, and, and research that allowed us to get to that point. Uh, there were vaccines that were developed for SARS-1, which we, we knew that the spike uh, uh, protein was going to be a good uh, a good target. So I'm I'm very hopeful. Um, what I'm what I'm really hoping for is that you know the the global north uh, does not go forward with these bilateral agreements, and that we think about sharing the limited supply uh, that we are going to have to deal with in 2021, because it is in the interest of everyone. If you, if you only vaccinate your own population, you are risking an, an, an endemic situation. And then every year, just like the flu, the Americans, the Canadians, and the, the French who hoarded the vaccine will have to get vaccinated. And that's not something that we want. Thanks, everyone. Professor Anzalo. You know, for me, uh, really, the, 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 the the ACT Accelerator gave us three pillars. We are not out of uh, this outbreak. We need good diagnostics and we need near patient diagnostics. We are having a major problem with supply of RT-PCR. So that pillar must go on. We also need the pillar on management. We need to ensure that uh, the clinical trials that are taking place in terms of looking at uh, repurposing of drugs, that is also going on. Because even if we get a vaccine in the next few weeks or months, this outbreak will still going on. So that those two pillars must go on. And then the last one is vaccines itself. And Ben Amon showed us that uh, on that scale, COVAX 
was at the bottom, <laughs> was completely <laughs> at the bottom. And that's where we African countries stay in. And then, when I was asking, does Africa need a, a, a COVID vaccine? I was asking that purposely for that reason. We need a COVID vaccine. We, will, we can start with prioritization, but eventually these vaccines must be available globally and we must debate and we must agree on a fair deal. So that is actually my push on that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Stanford. So a, a couple of thoughts. Um, having worked on vaccines for a long time, one of the things that's very frustrating is to develop a vaccine that doesn't get used, or doesn't get used effectively. When one thinks about the fact that we could, er we could eradicate, nearly eradicate cervical cancer, if we could get good uptake of the HPV vaccine, um, and yet we find vaccine hesitancy is a real impediment to having that happen, it's really distressing. And I'll remind everybody that the WHO in 2019 put vaccine hesitancy as one of the greatest threats to global health. So here we are dealing with the worst pandemic in 100 years. At the same time, as Dr. Amura outlined, we've got rising issues with regard to acceptability. So in that context, one thing, and this sort of speaks to the issue that Dr. Uh, Anzala mentioned, which is the, uh, since you can't immediately get vaccines, you may have the opportunity to look at what's going to have the three components that are gonna be most critical in reaching herd immunity if you don't want to have to immunize 100% of your population, you need the highest efficacy possible. You know this, Dr. Anzal, it's the rest of the audience. You need to have some impact, significant impact, hopefully, on an asymptomatic infection, as Dr. Vu asked in her question. And then the third is the issue of durability. There was a beautiful paper published about a month ago, a little more than a month ago, by Roy Anderson, a mathematical epidemiologist modeler out of, uh, out of London, uh, that really spoke to the issue of what percentage of the population you're going to have to immunize to reach herd immunity. And if the vaccine's got less than an 80% efficacy, it's 100%. So you hopefully, as we have to wait to see, get more data on these, these vaccines, you may be able to cherry pick the one that's going to have those three components so that you're not going to rely upon immunizing everybody to, to be able to control it in your populations. So anyway. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Stanbury. Uh, Dr. Larissa, you have the last words. Thank you. So um, I, I'll sort of echo what others have said. I think, you know, we're in some ways we're victims of our own success. I mean, the science has been stunning and the results, at least the initial ones are, are, are really startling. Uh, but the, all the science in the world doesn't do any good if people aren't confident that the vaccines going to be safe. And Dr. Ben Amore talked about this in detail. So I, I think, you know, the one of the main things we're going to have to do going forward is to continue to study individuals and provide safety data to assure them uh, that the vaccines are safe. We all know it's one thing to vaccinate 30,000 people, and then you, vac and you have what you find you vaccinate 10 million people, lots of stuff is gonna come up, some of which is related to the vaccine and some of which is not. And I think the public needs to feel like you're doing an honest and rigorous job at looking at these issues in order to have confidence to get vaccinated. Thank you very much. So I think it really leaves me uh, with just one final ask, which is to Sincerely thank the panelists, Dr. La Rosa, Dr. Stanbury, Professor Anzala, and Dr. Mo, for really an engaging discussion. I think for me, I've learned quite a lot, and I'm sure our audience has also learned a lot. You have seen that uh, this kind of discussions cannot be uh, time bound. You know, we need to discuss this even for much longer time, but that is the time we had today. So I want to thank you very much on behalf of the panel that uh, was able to join the call. Uh, for your really great insight. Um, I also want to take this chance to thank all the participants uh, who have listened to you, who have answered, uh, addressed you with some questions, and I'm sure they, they have also uh, taken a lot from your presentations. Then finally, I want to uh, thank uh, Columbia Global Centers, both here in Nairobi and Tunis, uh, for making this um, webinar possible. So uh, really, really thank you and wish you 
uh, happy holidays. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, bye-bye.